Hello everyone, it's 1 p.m. Eastern Time and that means it's time to begin another Kokoros Weather Talk webinar. I'm your host Henry Regis and along with me today is my Kokoros colleague Nolan Duskin. We're coming to you live from the Colorado Climate Center at Colorado State University here in sunny Fort Collins, Colorado. Our Weather Talk webinars are sponsored by grants from NOAA's Office of Education and the National Science Foundation. After our speaker's presentation today, we will open up the webinar for questions from our audience. All of our webinars are recorded for future viewing on the web. Well, today's webinar focus, focuses on something that we see an awful lot of out here during the summer in Colorado, and that's lightning. Our guest today is Ron Holly from Oro Valley, Arizona, and that's just outside of Tucson. Ron is a fellow of the American Meteorological Society. He's also a meteorological consultant who has worked to educate the public on issues relating to lightning safety and the demographics of lightning victims and damages. If you want to know about lightning, well, Ron is definitely the guy to ask. Ron, we welcome you today. It's great to have you with us. All right. Good morning. Ron, we sure appreciate you being on. This is Nolan. You lived in Colorado for a while, didn't you? Yes, I did. I was there in Boulder for 12 years. Uh, so we've known of you and your lightning work for a long time. And we should be seeing Ron's screen here. Any lightning yet in Arizona this year? Nothing. I don't Nothing. Think we've, we've had anything yet. We don't really start the season until about the first of July, so uh, we're into our very dry period here that's uh, sunny yesterday, last week, next week, the week after. So. We, very we typical, very we typical for it. May. <laughs> yeah, but you start getting eager for the coming coming lightning season. Oh yeah, we get ramped up. So uh, yeah, yeah, we, we had a few good. Now, Ronnie, you should have seen something come on your screen. Um, yes. To make you the presenter. Okay, do I get show my screen? There you go. There we go. Okay. We are ready to roll. All right. And you can see my mouse moving? We can. Very good. All right. That's what Take it away. Um, I don't want to get rid of... Uh, I still have your uh, control box up here. I want to get rid of that. Ron, you can push the red arrow to minimize that. There it goes. All right, here we go. All right, uh, I'm near Tucson, and uh, this is a view from my house uh, in Oro Valley looking toward the Catalina Mountains when there are storms in the summertime. Um, let's see here. I'm not advancing. There we go. I have four general topics. I'll talk about lightning, lightning climatologies, detection, and safety. And I noticed yesterday I was going through this that almost half of my talk is on safety. This is another view from my house. The mountains are green and a nice storm going on. So what's the problem with Ron, lightning? I think we, we're having a hard time hearing you. If you could just talk a little louder, that might be. All right. Okay. Is that a little better? Yep. There we go. There we go. Um, what's the reason for lightning being an issue? Here's a few facts about it. 50,000 degrees, uh, 200 million volts, typically around in the 25,000 amp area, it's an inch in diameter, and it travels at a third of the speed of light. And uh, I took some fulgurites, uh, I'll tell you a story about this in a minute, and I put them on a scanner, and I have these, these are just one or two inch long ones. Fulgurites are formed when lightning hits sand, and this is a picture of one that's three feet long. This is a, collected in Egypt. There is a company called Carion Mineral in Paris. I've come to the Tucson Gen and Mineral Show every year. And I didn't buy this big long one that his son is buying. That's about $3,000. I get the $30 grab bag. That's what's in this picture here. But they have holes in the middle for reasons we don't know. And they actually are glass. You plink them together like two glasses hitting each other. So that's what lightning can do. That's why it's an important issue. And when they, by the way, they take um, 
trucks and drag behind them in the Sahara, various places, and there's only two things out there that are not sand, and that's one of them is fulgurites, the other one are meteorites, because there's no, nothing has lived there for thousands of years. Here's a good picture taken years ago in uh, Switzerland, looking from a mountain by Lugano, looking horizontally, and the city of Lugano is down below. You can see the cloud to ground flash starting up toward the top. It's coming down. It branched there. It didn't make it. It branched, went down here. That one didn't make it. But the one that was were downward leaders. But the one that didn't make it is this bright one. As the branching occurs, you can see them all branching downward. It reaches near the ground. And then one of the branches connects with the ground. And then the light goes back up the channel. So it is truly cloud to ground. Uh, although the light goes back up in this very faint channel that was originally starting in the cloud. Very rarely you'll see these occurring. These are upward uh, flashes from tall towers. Um, it isn't a hundredth of a percent. It's probably a thousandth of a percent. Now they call, they're very impressive and a lot of people take pictures of them, but they are very, very rare. So let's talk about lightning. Here's something I want you all to we'll say it together. A cloud to ground flash has one or more return strokes. It's important to remember that. And we'll show some examples. There is cloud lightning that is before cloud to ground lightning in probably 70% of all storms. And there's probably three times as many flashes in the cloud as there are coming to ground. Here's a picture of the strokes. You can see here, I was in my, at my house in Tucson looking toward those mountains moving the camera back and forth, and you can see here's the first return stroke, and then as I was moving the camera, here's another return stroke that went down the same channel, and a third one that went down the same channel. And this particular stroke of this flash over here actually had two of them. So when you see them parallel, um, I was moving the camera, and occasionally there's a strong enough wind will actually move the channel. So those are, this whole event here is a flash. And then these are the individual return strokes. Now, cloud lightning can be really, really long. I took this picture in Norman, Oklahoma, and I was working there. Um, this is probably 10 or 20 miles long. The longest flash like this that we've ever measured was 120 miles long, like this, measured with the detection system. Absolutely continuous, lasted about two seconds. What is imp what's the impacts of lightning? I've been working on this topic for a number of years. The uh, round number is 24,000 deaths and 10 times as many injuries a year from lightning. Another estimate a couple of years ago, um, a very credible approach that had 8,000 deaths. We don't know. Uh, and I'll talk about that later. Half of all the fires in the western U.S. are from lightning. There's a third of a million insurance claims filed and paid due to lightning in the U.S. every year. And the average the last time I saw was about four and a half thousand dollars. So there are easily several billion dollars in direct damages and in avoidance costs every year in the U.S. Polarity, I'm not going to show you the typical diagrams of the positives go up and down. It's hard to follow some of that. But uh, 90 to 95 percent of all cloud lightning lowers negative charge. The rest of it lower, less, rest of them lower positive charge. Half of all the positives have something called long continuing current, LCC. That's between those strokes that I showed in this picture here. In some cases, there'll be a continuous flow of current to the ground. It's like a branding iron being touched to the ground. And so it imparts a lot more energy. And of course, it, when they do occur in the, right, in the wrong place, they do start forest fires and they cause more damage. But every flash is fully capable of causing a death or significant damage. There are no weak lightning uh, events. Climatologies. Here's a map of the U.S. lightning from the National Lightning Detection Network. If you look at the scale over here, on the left, it uh, goes up in Florida in three places here, up to 33 flashes per square mile per year. That's every year around Tampa, around Palm Beach, and north of, uh, around Daytona Beach, a little south of there. So Florida, in terms of flash density, is clearly the number one state in the country. Texas is bigger and actually has more number of flashes, but the density over Florida is much higher. You see this also high along the Gulf Coast. 
and gradually decreases to the north and to the west. But I'm out here in Arizona, we're right here in Tucson, we have big mountains to the south and there's the rim to the northeast, there's maxima around in the western states. So there's a lot of detail here, there's been some studies of a number of these things and it's been a topic that I've worked on for quite a few years. But this pattern is pretty much consistent from year to year. The small details change, but this is what happens when you pile up uh, 15, 14 years worth of data. 15. Month to month, June, July, and August for the whole country are definitely the strongest. About two-thirds of all lightning occurs during those three months. The ramp up occurs uh, gradually up to the summer, and then it drops off fairly quickly. I have some maps here of, of monthly lightning density. We're coming up on June. You can see Florida, the sea breezes along the coast are very strong, and there's a lot of lightning on the plains. Notice here in Arizona in June, we're virtually um, free of lightning. And suddenly here in Arizona, in the Four Corners states, lightning increases very significantly into July. It's probably the biggest change per, from month to month in the whole country. Florida continues to be very strong and is a general spread across the whole eastern part of the country. In fact, pretty much everywhere in July is the peak. Then in August, Florida continues, the southwest continues. There's a maximum up over uh, the Plain states. And anyway, there is a paper on this with all the months in it that we published last year. Time of day, um, I just did this work in the last couple of months, 10 a.m. to noon. Look what's happened here in Florida. We already have a lot of lightning on shore, in other words, on the beaches, all across the Gulf Coast before noon. And there also are maxima over the mountains in the western states before noon. And this has been a, an ongoing concern for safety that uh, lightning starts before noon and people are thinking it's not going to happen until afternoon. If you go, if you go to the uh, noon to 2 o'clock map, areas that had lightning before noon just expanded and filled in. You can see, for example, here in Florida, the uh, uh, maxima that were along the shore had just grown and over the mountains in the west it is in the same places as it was earlier. And then from midnight to two, just one more map in the time period, the places that are driven by local heating like Florida and the mountains in the western states are f essentially free of lightning and all those storms that formed over the mountains and in the lee of the Rockies have moved east and they march across the country. And uh, actually it's the thunderstorm maximum at Kansas City, Missouri is at 6 in the morning and uh, it shows up in the lightning data. Ron, this is Henry. It sounds like your sound is fading again, just to, to let you know that. All right. Let me got it right up. Better. There you go. All right. Thanks. Maybe it uh, slips a little bit. Thank you. So let's talk about detection. How do you, in the world, can you come up with those kind of maps? And why would you? Well, ways the lightning data are used are all these in the list here. Uh, see airports and rocket launches, um, safety, fire, weather. Uh, there's been work on severe weather, winter weather. You can estimate rainfall from lightning because it usually Company is accompanied by heavy rain. It's actually being assimilated into the numerical weather prediction models and nitrous oxide. Actually, lightning is a fairly significant contributor to it, and uh, it's a major topic these days. So many of you are, you are all of you are observers, and, and many of you are meteorologists. So how would you use the cloud to ground lightning data? Well, first of all, it's a direct indicator of where the lightning thread is. It also varies along with other things, which makes it an interesting complement, such as along with radar and rainfall. Uh, some forecasters say, I, I would like to wait until I see the lightning before I, I know that something has really become important or severe or whatever. In some places in the western states and in other countries, radar is not very full in terms of coverage, and so lightning data can be a substitute for missing data. Um, in many countries, that is, it is the only uh, national network of uh, convection or thunderstorms. And also, a little plug for the uh, processes, when you have lightning, that means that that cloud had at least part of it, the top of it, was colder than freezing. 
and you have quite a bit of liquid water content, you have small heel or grumple, and you have an updraft, and you have small water droplets. So you, do, you have all those things going on, which can help you understand what, what is happening in that particular storm. So the most important one is that it means there's part of the cloud that's colder than freezing. So all of the world of lightning is divided into two parts, cloud to ground lightning and cloud lightning. I took this from my house, this is the cloud to ground flash. The, the, the picture got a little blushed. It isn't any wider than usual, but it's in a rain shaft, I think. And here's a cloud flash just going across the cloud without coming to ground. They may be connected. So how do you locate lightning? Well, there's networks of sensors, various uh, designs, and various frequencies. But uh, there's a time of arrival. Here's the actual lightning position right there at the end of the tip. Here's sensors around here. And there are equal distances of the time that it could have taken to reach that particular uh, sensor. So you divide these three lines up, and then you optimize where they should come up the best and you come up with that position. And then there's also direction finding, which has been around since the very beginning also. You have angles coming from the sensor, and they all missed that exact point, but they came close. Usually the accuracy is on the order of a few hundred yards. So the optimum position is in the middle of this triangle. So I know this is complicated, but I just wanted you to know that all that spherical trigonometry that you didn't think anybody used is being used big time in this process. And finally, in this particular case, here's five sensors in Florida. The flash was here. And here's angles from various sensors around Florida. And here's these times of arrival. And so you actually have very much overdetermined the location by having five angles and five times time of arrivals that, uh, from a mathematical point of view, overdetermine the solution. And so the lo location is known very well in this case. So there's a whole large literature on this particular topic. And uh, it gets very complicated. One of the recent approaches has been to develop global lightning detection. And here's a day's worth of lightning. This was a good day that I happened to capture oh, almost a year ago now. But it's looking like that. Actually, I just looked at it a few minutes ago. It looks about like that today. So we had over 2 million strokes over the world. All of the Americas were lit up. The US in June is active. Uh, Southeast Asia is always active. Uh, Africa is a little bit deficient from detection, but that's been solved. Europe is active. So anyway, something going on almost everywhere in the world, including the southern oceans in the most remote parts of the world where it's cold. There still is enough updraft and uh, other things going on with the hail and grapple and all that. But you actually are getting quite a bit of lightning, isolated storms, but it's, not a, it's almost every day there's something out there. So there's a lot to learn in uh, looking at data like this this. I piled up the data from last uh, summer from a network called GLD360. And you can see the progression from June to August over Brazil. Tremendous number of strokes over the Amazon. Just a couple words about cloud lightning here. Um, Here's another picture I took from my house of just a cloud flash with no connection to cloud to ground that I can see. Um, we ha the BISL has had a network in, in the Tucson area, this is Tucson, detecting cloud lightning. And all these little sticks, for example, here are, are connections of cloud flashes, like in that picture. In those pictures, you can see how there's a tremendous ex horizontal extent of lightning over long distances. This is on the order of 50 miles. There it is up there. It's 25 kilometers. Uh, so this is a couple of hundred kilometers across the map. One of the cases that has been really interesting is that at Dallas-Fort Worth, the airport is in the, in the middle. Let's see, where is it? There it is over here. Yeah, that's the airport. This flash started over here, east of Dallas, went across 
these are all pulses from that long cloud flash, went across the northern part of this metro area, came down and ended the last part of that flash was south of Fort Worth. And along the path, it dropped cloud to grounds here, 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 and here. And the reason it was called attention uh, to us was that it injured a worker at the airport. And we couldn't understand why, with only cloud to ground data, why this had occurred, because the storm was seemingly over here. But there was a long trailing anvil behind it. This is one of the difficulties of lightning safety, is that long flashes like this can occur for over long distances. This one took about two seconds. OK, let's talk about safety. Now here's kind of the last half of my talk, and I suspect there'll be a question or two. All right, there are two reliable, safe places inside a large, substantial, frequently occupied building. I'll talk about that. And inside a fully enclosed metal topped vehicle. And I'll talk about that. First of all, we'll start out aren't with a few myths. Lightning is attracted to metal. No. But it is, but lightning, after it hits something metal, will transmit quite a distance. But it wasn't the metal that attracted it. For example, trees. Probably half of all the lightning strikes the ground in the world hit trees. And there's no metal in them. Direct strike is the most common casualty false. We'll talk about that in detail. There's things that I can do outside that always be safe. No. If I'm out of the rain, I'm safe. No. And rubber tires provide protection. No. So there's certain safety inside of a large, substantial, frequently occupied building or a metal to fully enclosed metal type vehicle. Not certain is what you wear or carry, where or how you stand, on what you stand. In fact, there is no certain way to be safe from lightning outside anywhere. So every year I update these maps of the last 10 years of lightning fatalities. Um, this is the one ending 2010, probably the next few weeks I'll update this and up through 2011, from 2002 to 2011. See that the no largest number of lightning fatalities is in Florida, 62. The second largest is in Colorado. Third largest is Texas. And see generally the southeastern states have the largest numbers. Because the population varies so much among these states, this is a population weighted uh, map. And uh, there's two general categories, uh, the maximum in the southeast, where of course there's a lot of lightning. But then there's also this group of states in the western uh, northern mountains that have uh, the highest rates, and also in the northeast. I have been through a lot of uh, analyses going by population, by number of flashes, by um, moisture, dew point, all sorts of things, elevation. There are no really easy answers to this. A lot of this seems to be related to uh, human activity. Well, one of the issues we saw that the lightning over Florida and Colorado is very strongly clustered in the afternoon, and people's activities are strongly clustered during the afternoon. And I've been speculating the last few months that there's all this lightning in the middle part of the country, but it's occurring at night, and so the vulnerability to people may be a little bit less. There's a lot of factors there, and there's no single quick answer. OK. One of the things that, uh, just a minute. I Somehow ended up with my screen. There we go. Interesting things to look at as we go back to 1900, the number of people killed by lightning that we know about. Look at these numbers in the 20s and 30s. It was up over 400 people killed per year. We are now down into the 30s per year. How could that be? Because the population has gone up by a factor of three or four since then. Um, I'm not getting an advance here. Let's try it again. There we go. The uh, one of the factors is uh, here's the deaths per million. It's it's been going down in red. So we're down to 0.1 or 0.2 deaths per million, where it used to be as high as six per million. But the percentage of rural population 
has gone from 60% at the turn of the century, last century, down to 15%. And so more people are in urban areas, less people are out as in those times uh, working outdoor and agricultural areas. And also the buildings have very substantially improved since then. And I think unfortunately, I'll put in a plug to say, I think people spend too much time inside these days. And so we're not outside as much as we ought to be and used to be, just in general. And here's a comparison from the 1890s on the top, so 1990s on the bottom of what people were uh, where the people were, what they were doing at the time of fatalities. This was from an old publication from the 1890s. Agriculture, you see, was about 25% back then, and it's almost uh, it's a you know, less than half as much before. Indoors is not a major factor of fatalities these days in the U.S. It was half of all the deaths back then. People were killed inside, sitting at their kitchen table, sitting uh, by the fireplace. Uh, in, in their beds inside the house because there was no wiring and plumbing and general structural uh, integrity to the buildings, say a wooden hand-built house, so that lightning, when it hit that structure, had no preferred paths. Now we do. We'll talk about that in a little bit, bit more. Quite a few people were outdoors in all sorts of things, not including agriculture. Uh, and now that's the biggest single category, just the general one. Recreation back then, people didn't have time for a lot of recreation. Now we do. It's bigger. It hasn't increased, has not increased substantially in the last 20 years, but it is much bigger than it was 100 years ago. Uh, sports has gone up too as, as uh, leisure activities have changed. So let's talk about what makes it a, a safe uh, location. Here's how a clogged ground flash looks close up. There's a very famous picture by Johnny Ottery, you may well have seen, her, seen this, 1984 it is, in Alabama. He got this from a pickup truck at 2 in the morning. Here's the lightning like I showed before. Unsuccessful downward leaders, one trying there. There's one here that didn't come to ground. The one that finally came to ground was this one that hit the tree. What's really interesting here is that there's an upward leader from another branch next to the tallest part of the tree. There must have been another one, a big one from the tallest part of the tree. So preferred strike points are tall and isolated and pointed. And that's preferred, tall, isolated, and pointed. So here we are with two uh, light poles in a parking lot that looked tall and isolated and sort of pointed. And what did the lightning do? It came down in between. That's what it does. So you can't outguess what it's going to do. Another famous picture about three years ago, a TV meteorologist in Des Moines, Iowa, I think it was, sent a number of us this picture and said, I heard a boom outside at 2 in the morning. I went out to the mailbox, and this is what I found. It's still smoking, amazingly enough, like 7 or 8 in the morning. And look what's around it. Here's a metal sign. It didn't hit that. There's a big power pole over here. It didn't hit that. It didn't hit the tree. It didn't hit these trees hit that thing. It's very difficult. What did I say? Tall, isolated, and pointed. Don't count on it. So when it comes to lightning safety, there's a website, a wonderful website, that uh, is at www.lightningsafety.noaa.gov. Um, I think it's the best, act, best act website in the world in lightning safety. It's the Lightning Safety Awareness Week in the last full week in June. And a number of us have collaborated on this since 2001. One of them is John Jensenius at the National Weather Service in Gray, Maine. And for the last five years, I haven't updated this for the last years yet, um, he went through and came up with the activity distribution. And look at this wide variety of situations, so walking, standing, running, and hiking, waiting, fishing, yard work. This is a category that seems to be taking over, trying to take shelter, all sorts of other things, and work, and a lot of other things. That's the activity. Now we go to the location. Water is a big component under a tree, or, or a tree in the yard is actually the biggest topic. I'm working on a paper on that right now open fields, sports fields, in the yard just outside the home where you have safety right nearby, on the road, 
uh, boat boats uh, in general are really dangerous. Uh, the, these vehicle ones typically are people standing by a vehicle or getting in and out of a vehicle. But we'll talk about that. So what happens? Death from lightning is due to Coleman cardiopulmonary arrest. Uh, this is from Dr. Marianne Cooper, an MD that I've worked with for years. Uh, they got this from her. These are neurological injuries, which are really difficult brain and spinal column injuries. Can't order things well, seizures. Um, because of these things, they have difficulty with work. And it's generally not well understood or appreciated in the medical community because you often can't see these sorts of things. It's, it, personality changes, becomes isolation and depression. And it gets worse. So there is an organization um, let me go back, called LSCSSI, Lightning Strike and Electric Shock Survivors International. I've been to a number of those um, meetings over the years, and it's not a nice experience. Um, anyway, there is a major difference between lightning strike victims, which are neurological or cardiopulmonary, and electric shock, which are more physical and burns. Burns are essentially irrelevant in lightning. Okay, I have this other question. 80, about 80% 80 of all lightning deaths and injuries are to males. Every study anywhere in the world for decades, even back into the 1800s, it's always males, 80%. And most often, these are young adults. Now, Marianne Cooper and I and others have been, were at a conference some years ago, and uh, we were speaking about um, mountain situations. And the doctor that was there said, well, it isn't just lightning. It's 80% of the male young adults who are killed or in seriously injured in mountain situations are, are the same group in uh, hiking, climbing, risk-taking, uh, extreme sports, and so on. So lightning is following this trend. You can say what you want, but that's the nature of the business. So. A number, how are we doing? A number of us have gotten together over the years and tried to estimate these five major categories in terms of their relative importance. We feel that direct strike is certainly no more than 5%. Contact is small. Side flash is quite large. Ground current is the largest one. And upward leader is part of it also. So direct strike is very uncommon. I can, I can barely remember any such papers, uh, events, and I've looked at thousands of them. And lightning safety is not about the direct strike. And if you look at what people have written up, oh, you should do this and do that, it's all about that. It's the wrong thing to worry about. So here's a direct strike. Hardly ever happens. Hardly ever. Contact, 3 to 5%. Um, we worry about this. It does, it, it's not a major factor. Side flashes, uh, as you saw the number with the tree situation, quite a few of them seem to be related to side flashes, someone standing under a tree where it comes horizontally from the tree, or it can occur from fences and uh, poles and all sorts of things. The biggest one is ground current and step voltage. You want to stop and think about this for a minute. The one on the right probably is not what you'd expect, but um, ground current it's looking for the quickest path, and if the lightning hits the side of a hill and someone's inside of the cave, the person makes a nice continuous um, path. That is not a safe place. So why are cows killed more often than people? Let's say the lightning hits here. The back feet of the cow is, is about 20 feet away, let's say, whatever and another 10 feet away is the front feet. There's a big step voltage difference between the front and the back feet of the cow because they're so far apart. The person's feet can't be more than a couple feet apart, and so there's less of a difference. And so that's why you see pictures quite often of large numbers of animals that are killed uh, by, it's often by a tree or by a fence. That's because their step voltage across the front to the back feet is larger. And this is the ground current coming down too. And we think this in general, in many different forms, is the, the most dominant situation where lightning gets somewhere nearby. And it's a luck of the draw. 
when you're outside. You can you shouldn't be out there whether it uh, is fatal or not. Upper leader is one which uh, you saw that picture coming up from the tree. This happens from people and occasionally, and we're, this is a more mysterious one because it's kind of hard to identify, but it almost certainly is around 10 to 15 percent. Okay, let's get into the safety end of things. Um, did a study some years ago of um, successive flashes in Colorado when I was working there. Just look at the picture here on the right. Here's a bunch of flashes. They had to be within uh, five minutes and 15 kilometers of the previous one to be the same storm. So look what it does. It jumped over here, and then it went over here, and then it went over here, and it went down there, and it came back around, and it ended up over here. It did not go in straight lines from southwest to northeast, for example, the way a storm might be moving. You can't extrapolate things that well. It's relatively random and chaotic within the storm. But 80% of the successive flashes were within six miles of each other. That was the idea. And so we're, how did that end up being important? Well, the 30-30 rule, as you may have heard of, was developed based on this figure in 1998. The first 30 is you count the seconds from flash to bang of being 30 seconds. This was one of the questions. Sound travels at five seconds per mile. So at six miles, it comes from this figure. That's 30 seconds, and that's where the first 30 came from. Five seconds per mile. Think about that. You see the lightning, and you wait five seconds, and you think, oh, that's quite a ways away. No, it was only a mile away. That's the speed of sound, speed of a jet aircraft. The sound barrier is at 600 and some miles an hour. You can calculate it out. The second 30 is how long to wait for a storm after the last lightning and thunder, for example, in that Dallas-Fort Worth case with the long anvil uh, flash, how um, far back was it? If you wait 30 minutes at that airport, you would not have been outside. Um, this is kind of complicated, and it's, it's been modified for the first part, which is when is the storm coming? call it when thunder roars go indoors. Bill Roeder at Kennedy Space Center came up with that. It's absolutely perfect. Don't worry about counting. If you have thunder, it's close enough because six miles is 30 seconds time, and that's a long time. So just keep it simple. If um, someone is really like an airport or a air base or so on, it needs to be very uh, objective and very uh, efficient in their operations, you can use lightning data to actually simulate this. It's being done all the time. It may be better to use 8 to 10 miles, but that's uh, depending on the situation. The 30 minutes at the end is really kind of an extreme number. If you have a very large event, 30 minutes is not a bad idea to wait with a large crowd and not go in and out. If you're in your backyard working and you hear thunder, you go inside. If you don't hear anything for 5 or 10 minutes and you you can go back out because you can get back in in a matter of seconds. So it's variable. So 30 minutes is the ultimate uh, large crowd situation. So what's safe? A large substantial building is where you live or work. It has grounded wiring and plumbing. And often these days we have metal structural members like um, uh, beams and so on. And it follows a building code. And it's surrounding someone with a Faraday cage-like effect, and you've all probably seen the examples of people inside of metal cages with lightning going around them. You're essentially doing that. Buildings, as I said, are hit all the time. A third of a million homes have insurance claims every year. That's not unusual. Um, in vehicles, direct strikes to vehicles, I studied 50 or 75 of them. Half of the cases said, boy, that was an amazing experience, but I was uninjured. That was their quote, uninjured. Now, the tires may flatten when the current flows around the car. You hit the car, it goes around the car, and comes down, goes through the axles or bumpers, and guess what? It goes through the tires, and it's going to flatten the tires. The myth has developed, apparently, that the flat tires, the tires were protecting you. That's a byproduct of the current going around the outside of the car. It's not, nothing to do with protection. So inside of it is a very safe place, not standing outside, not touching it, not getting it. Not getting in and out, though. Now, in the U.S., in dwellings, the only deaths from lightning in houses or dwellings are almost all of them for homes catching fire 
after a lightning strike at night with elderly, young, or physically or mentally disabled people. Other, everyone else can get out. Not a good situation, but it's survivable. And usually these are involve some defect in, in the buildings. Now, I worry more about outside the U.S. These are the types of ho homes I've collected on, on the web over the years. This is where people live. Billions of people live in places like this around the world. And you see just from a sample that I had, um, 53 events, 106 deaths. There's something called a hut, which is what people call them in Africa. And average of three deaths per event. A lot of people, unfortunately, are being killed. This is where the large numbers of lightning deaths occur. In the U.S. and anywhere in the world, anytime you see the word shelter attached to it, don't stay there. This was a, actually a picnic at a park here in Tucson, and someone that we know put this sign up top here. It says, this structure is unsafe for use like during lightning storms. Seek suitable shelter elsewhere. That shelter, in that case, in this case, in a, this parking lot, it's just on the other side of the, the uh, dirt here. So anytime you see the word shelter attached to it, get away from it and go to your car or a big building. Because what happens here? If lightning, when lightning hits this, there's no safe path around the people inside for it to go to ground. It'll go through the people instead. And another example, this baseball dugout is one of the worst possible examples of being dangerous. What are they sheltering from? Rain. What's going on? It has an open side, so there's no path. It's small, so you're close to the sides. There's, there's nothing to conduct material around you. It's a nearby tall utility pole, which could get hit. There's water in the ground to tra transfer a, a strike. And tents give no safety. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's like it isn't even there when, as far as lightning is concerned. There's no, there's no uh, protection. And outside of the U.S. in schools, I'm also disappointed to see just how many of these cases there are. These are schools in developing countries, you see they absolutely don't even have electricity. So there are cases in a number of Asian and African countries with dozens of school children hit, uh, killed on a school day. So coming to a close here, no, there's, no, there's no deaths inside of big buildings. Certainly there are these uh, disabled uh, nighttime events for dwellings, small structures, uh, and gazebos and so on are dangerous. Just go indoors. Outside of the U.S., unfortunately, there's a lot of deaths in schools and uh, small structures. The problem is that there are no safe buildings and there are no metal, fully enclosed metal top vehicles in, in developing countries. And so the best thing is to provide some sort of lightning protection to these schools and huts and so on. There's a very minimal effort beginning in some countries, but their priorities are so huge that that probably is not at the top of the list. So as I mentioned before, um, the rough number is six deaths per billion per year. If you apply that to four billion people around the world, you get 24,000 deaths and 240,000 injuries. Another one, time is 8,000 deaths per year. And we need data, but amazingly enough, within the last three months, a study came from Malawi that showed a death rate of 84 per million per year, which is an amazingly high number. No idea how common that number is. So that's it. I will stop here and um, we'll take questions. Ron, Ron this is Nolan. I'm going to quick throw in a question here while Henry's assembling questions from the from attendees, and that is, uh, how far back do this does this global lightning detection system go? Because that's really quite a, an, an amazing breakthrough. And, and what sort of detection efficiency does that global network have? Well, Vaisola has put this out within the last 18 months. Um, the current situation is that we're probably picking up more than 50% of all uh, strokes in the world, ground to ground strokes. And in, um, in the Americas and Southeast Asia, it looks like it's more like 70%. So uh, I was just looking at the screen over here this morning, and it's at uh, 2 million strokes in the last 24 hours around the world. So, and the accuracy is, is, only, is less than 5 miles. So that's, 
Nothing short of incredible. And when did the lightning detection systems begin in the U.S.? And how did you do lightning research before you had that? Well, I didn't do it. That's when they came around, that's when I started doing research, actually. Um, the first lightning um, little network was put out in the late 70s for Kennedy Space Center. And then it went out in the early 80s to the Bureau of Land Management in Alaska, and then immediately in the western states. The U.S. network became operational over the whole 48 states in 1989. So it's been going since then continually with a number of upgrades. And now and people there are can... About, I was going to say there's about 25 million cloud ground flashes a year. That's the number I wanted to throw out. I don't think I did. Yeah. And was that estimate, I mean, people gave estimates of that in textbooks 50 years ago. Uh, were there estimates of the number of strikes per day or per year accurate 50 years ago? No. They were not accurate. They were not Under even close to being accurate. Underestimated. Well, it, there is the old idea of the thunderstorm day, which was developed uh, from the human observer at airports from the old uh, uh, observation sites around the world. And uh, thunderstorm days have been shown to have a relatively small or poor relationship with the actual number of lightnings. There's so many factors that are involved in hearing a thunderstorm that it really wasn't very good. I mean, it might have grossly said, yeah, there's more lightning in Africa than there is in Iceland, but that's about all you can say. So thunderstorm day maps are, are essentially gone. So now we know the actual that's lightning frequency. Yeah, interesting. That's where I got into it. It was in the uh, early 80s when the data first uh, were being distributed. Well, Ron, thank you so much. That was a, a very informative presentation. Uh, we've got a lot of questions coming in. Actually, I'm going to ask you a question myself before we begin. I, I've kind of had a I'm going back and forth to debate with a friend of mine uh, as to uh, whether it's safe to be outside when the, the certain storms just has, have in-cloud lightning with no cloud-to-ground strikes. And so is it safe to be outside during those, and, and what, what are you, your views on that? No. <clears throat> um, we, we found that all cloud-to-ground lightning uh, flashes or strokes are underneath uh, cloud channels. So if there's a cloud channel overhead, there is always the risk that one of the, some part of it will put one down a cloud to ground to the ground, like that picture from Dallas Fort Worth with those four cloud to grounds. They came down in that path. So anywhere along that path was dangerous. So we feel that uh, for a true lightning threat, you really do need to uh, uh, pr take precautions when it's overhead. Yeah. Do do, do you, is there, is there an, a, a frequency or a number of how many storms do not have cloud to ground? Are, are on the, out of 100, would you say one or two, or how does that? Oh, probably one or two percent of all thunderstorms don't have any cloud to ground. Uh, but sooner or later, they virtually always produce some cloud to grounds. The places where, they, where uh, thunderstorms occur with almost no cloud to ground are in the high plains from... Uh, Kansas and Nebraska, Colorado, and Wyoming, up to the Dakotas. It's in the lee of the Rockies. There's a number of factors there that are hard to understand. But uh, there are storms there occasionally that will have no cloudy grounds. But sooner or later, they almost always do. Great. Well, thanks. Well, we've got questions coming in. Let me go ahead and take a few here. We've got a lot of questions. We'll try to go through this quickly and answer as many as we can. Uh, Lisa writes, so if there's lightning going on outside, is it safe to take a shower? Uh, no. That's the conducting path that uh, the second mechanism I showed is contact voltage. No, there actually are a couple of injuries a year in the U.S. and around the world, people touching uh, uh, plumbing fixtures. Water is a good conductor of electricity. It doesn't matter whether the pipes are plastic or not. Water is a good conductor, and it also has uh, electric pumps attached to it, electrical wiring attached to the pump. Uh, plumbing to make things heat up and do things. So uh, there's too many ways things can go wrong. Just just wait. Here's one that several people have asked is, what is heat lightning? I grew up in Indiana and uh, used to be out with relatives in the farm and so on. And heat lightning is just lightning that's too far away to hear the thunder. So the range of thunder, audible thunder, is around 10 miles, maybe 12 miles. 
stream situation, maybe 15 miles. So if it's more than 15 miles away at night and uh, you see lightning, it's just plain old ordinary lightning and you're just too far away to, to see it. And if, you, if you're in the Midwest, it may look yellow because the, sky, the clouds are, the sky is humid, the air is humid, and may have particles in it during the summertime, so it makes it look yellow. There's nothing, nothing different about it. If you were close to the storm, it would look exactly like any other lightning. Here's one. Um, the uh, question is, I've heard about a term called ball lightning. The rumor is that ball lightning can float in a window of a home and float around the house. Is that true or not? Uh, apparently, yes. Um, I'll put on my mercenary hat and said, if you can get a credible picture of ball lightning, I'll get you ten thousand dollars and I'll take ten percent. So there are no credible lightning uh, ball lightning pictures. However, there are plenty of reports of it, and uh, they always occur in the vicinity of a thunderstorm, usually in small confined spaces, and darn if I know what it is. There was a paper published just in the last six months out of France where they summarized lots of cases, and it's almost always uh, in a confined space and always pretty near to lightning is already occurring, so I don't really know what it is. Here's one from Eva in North Carolina. She says, does lightning release nitrogen, a type of fertilizer? Yes, it does. That last thing I had on my list of um, things that people study with lightning data is NOx. The amount of nitrous oxide produced by lightning relative to the total is somewhere between, I don't know, 10 and 30 percent. So of all the ni natural nitrous oxide in the air, at least, up to a third of it comes from lightning. Yes, it is productive. Okay, thanks. Here's one from Gordon. Georgia wants to know if cordless phones are safe, uh, and what about cell phones? They're, they're safe, as long as you're in a safe place. Standing outside, you're unsafe, but if you're inside your house, absolutely safe. You're not having that connection to the wiring and plumbing or metal structural elements. Think of what happens when the lightning hits your house. If you're not connected by wire or plumbing, then there's no way for the lightning to reach you. And so the corded phone would be unsafe? Unsafe, yes. Right. There was a death in the U.S. two years ago in a corded phone. Here's one from Ed. Wants to know if you could come out, uh, comment on lightning from the blue, the, that bolt from the blue. What's that all about? Okay. Um, that's a, a, Lightning does stuff. This is a disconcerting thing that it does. Uh, again, actually in New Mexico seems to be the U.S. Uh, capital of this, at least that's where it's been seen most often. Let's say you have a nice isolated storm. It's, uh, I don't have a picture of one here, but uh, a nice isolated storm is vertical like a big cylinder. For whatever reason, occasionally lightning will come out the side of the cloud, go straight out horizontally up to 10 miles and then come straight down to the ground and hit something. And uh, in the mountains of, in the west, you can actually not have any clouds overhead, and there can be a storm in the next valley over. It has happened where it's come out sideways and come down. They're quite scarce. They do tend to be occurring in, I think, in drier places, but there's also a picture from Puerto Rico that shows it the same way, two or three miles away. So it is, it's, it's a bolt from the blue in the sense that it's clear overhead. So it's frustrating and uh, just part of the reason not to try to take chances outside. Here's Dave in Arizona. Dave says his house is three miles from yours. He was hit, his house was hit in 1999, July. Uh, do lightning rods help protect buildings? All right. Get, we talked about this. Let's talk about lightning rods. I have sl backup slides here. Okay. Um, Lightning rods work great. They're all over the place. If you know where to look, you'll see them. I, I took this picture down here at the Grand Canyon. This is a, a shelter from the sun. I don't know why they put it on there because that's absolutely not going to be safe. Absolutely not safe. Anyway, they put a lightning rod on it. I didn't talk, talk to the Park Service. Here's a building that I saw. It has a rod on top of it. Essentially what happens is you have a rod. A house is going to be hit. It is going to be hit. Like I said, a third of a million a year in the U.S. are hit. So when it hits the house, you want to control it. So you have something sticking up. Hopefully it's all isolated and pointy. It'll do its job. Not always. 
comes down this wire and goes down into a very big, substantial ground rod and brings it safely into the ground. Now things can happen along the way. You don't want to be touching wiring and plumbing and uh, occasionally could get a side flush. If you look at uh, power stations, you'll see them all over the place. You'll, if you look at hospitals, airports, uh, police stations, schools, you'll see lightning rods. Some, mostly these days are quite small. They're closely sp spaced together. Uh, they don't stop lightning from striking a building, but they control it. And you need to use a specialist uh, on this uh, to do it right. And there is another thing called catenary wires. It's a little hard to see, but if you look between these tall things here at the Kennedy Space Center, these are actually these are lightning rods with wires in between. And everything inside this area is absolutely protected. Here's a rocket being uh, uh, worked on here. So these catenary wires do work, and this is what they put over utility substations. You'll see them all over the place. So sort of like this is right here. So anyway, something for you to look at. You'll find them out there. Ron, I remember when I was a kid hearing people that didn't want to put a lightning rod up because they thought it would attract lightning to their house. There's there's no truth to that. Is that right? Right. right. Okay. All right, here's one uh, from Anita in Virginia. And how far from a storm can cloud to ground lightning strike? Well, several things here. One of them is what is a storm? I, I think the thing that we're worried about uh, the rain at the ground. Um, the rain is the rain shaft at the ground, and then it ends, say, on the edge of it. This is there's this bolt from the blue that can be up to uh, 10 miles away or so. Those are pretty scarce, and maybe a little bit tendency to be in uh, drier areas, but I'm not sure. Um, but there can be an overhang from the anvil or from a squalling that can be up to two or three miles away from the rain shaft, and lightning can come down from that. And actually, you think of your squall lines coming in in the eastern part of the country where there's a, a forward-leaning anvil. Um, it probably has a little bit of radar echo. There'll be, there'll be lightning coming out of that, and particularly at the back side of big thunderstorms and squall lines, there's lightning occurring in the anvil that goes on sometimes for 20 or 30 or 40 minutes at a low rate. Those appear to be very dangerous to people. Here's one from Ed, and he wants to know, uh, is it safe to be out during thunder snow? Well, it's any thunder snow is uh, lightning occurring when it's snowing. There's uh, plenty of uh, studies of that recently. University of Missouri, by the way, did a very nice study. If you just Google University of Missouri thunder snow project, um, they just finished the project last year. I was peripherally involved in. Um, yeah, it, it's lightning coming to ground. It's very low rate, but it does come to ground someplace. Um, someone wants to know, uh, do you know exactly to look for the uh, fulgurites, and, and do they have any in the United States? Fulgurites um, form best in silicon, that's silica, that's sand. And so you generally don't see it most places. You have to actually have sandy soil. We don't have sandy soil here in Arizona. The sand dunes are over in California, and they're over in New Mexico and so on. Uh, sand dunes, beaches with real sand would be the place to look. And one of the distinctive features is that little hole in the middle that's sort of a rugged on the outside. They're only about an inch across, something like that. So you, if you went, went to the beach and spent a lot of time looking around, you, you might find one. Doug from New Hampshire wants to know why the fatality rate is so much lower in New Hampshire compared to Vermont and Maine. Don't know. Okay. I don't know. There's been uh, speculation. I thought that there were more summer visitors in Maine than in other states, but I don't know why that should be the case there and not in New Hampshire and Vermont. Um, part of it is that it's weighted by population. And so the population uh, may be, uh, density may be different and so on. And it also, this last 10 years, we're only using fatality data because the injury data are sort of unreliable and variable, not as reliable as fatality. So getting much, much, much better. But uh, um, it can be a matter of just one or two fatalities over that 10-year period that would have kicked you up to a higher number. So I'm not sure it would make too, too much significance out of it. 
Here's another New England question from Ruta in Maine. She wants to know, is a waterbed a dangerous place to be if it's not connected to plumbing, but if it's connected to electric heater? I, you know, I came up a year or so ago, and I don't I forget. Uh, you know, in principle, I suppose, I, I just don't, I wouldn't get into worrying about things like this too much. Um, if, you're build, if your house is substantial and it has, it's building it, built according to code, things ought to work pretty well. If you're worried about it, I would buy a $100 surge protector and put it on the incoming line, and there's absolutely no, no way it can be a problem. Uh, it, it has a slight potential, but a surge protector will take care of it. I should talk about that for a minute. Um, people that are in the electrical engineering protection area tell me that any surge protector for less than $75 is nothing but a terminal outlet strip. They do nothing. You got to spend at least $75 or so to get something out of it. So uh, yes, I go ahead and spend that much money and uh, and put it in between the wall outlet and the bed, and I, I would not expect anything to ever happen. Okay, here's someone from Tampa area, and they say that uh, Tampa Orlando is, has the most lightning. Uh, is that correct? Uh, why so much in that particular area, and how does that frequency compare to southeast Florida? Um, well, let's go back to the map here real quick. You'll all be able to look at this uh, later, too. If you look down here, we um, drew three areas. One of them is Tampa area. One is north of the Cape, and one of them is Palm Beach. Um, and there's a link across the peninsula here between Tampa uh, across Orlando to the east coast. The reason that Tampa actually has the highest of these three maxima is that there is the, the bay here, which is very warm, and so there are uh, sea breezes set up along the ocean coast, and then there is a bay breeze uh, set up around the bay, Whoops. and so you have multiple sources of, of sea breezes and uh, coastal uh, thunderstorms occurring that interact with each other, and then without a strong wind, they tend to stay in the same place. In, in Florida, during the summer, when you, you saw there in June, July, and August, the winds out of the east, piles up the storms on the west coast, and so it's just a perfect setup. There's something like that occurring in different places around the world. Wherever there's a bay that is along a warm ocean coast, there's a maximum. There's one like that in China around Shanghai. So even Mobile Bay there looks like it's a little more than the other areas. Yeah, I was just looking along the coast here. There is one, see there's one here around the bay by Houston. Mobile Bay has one, and there's another one around New Orleans. You have all these sea breezes, and generally the, the prevailing flow is relatively light, so they, they tend to linger and interact and just keep going. And by the way, volunteers, uh, take a look at the Kokoraz precipitation maps for today, and you'll see amazing activity around Mobile Bay on the 24-hour precip ending this morning. Mm. Here's a question from North Carolina. If you're outside with no option to go indoors, where's the safest place to seek shelter? You explain that you don't need to stand beside tall objects, but at the same time, you don't want to be the tallest object around. Your choices are quite difficult. You have no safe place. We're, we're into that situation is, number one, I'll say this in the kindest way. I, can say it is that promise yourself you'll never be in that situation again because you are really in a dangerous situation. Um, all you can do is have risk reduction, and I, I, I'm very cautious about getting into this direction of thought because that's not happening. That situation should not happen to very many people these days. We almost always have a substantial building or a full enclosed metal top vehicle nearby, or you should have taken the time to get there or not continue the activity. All these things about crouching and so on and so on, what, what are those going to? They're going to this direct strike, which hardly ever happens. It's the ground current, and uh, 
that's the difficulty. Trees are difficult. Open fields are difficult. Standing next to tall objects is difficult. Your choices are become very, very uh, tenuous at best. Um, I, there is some recommendations uh, from the National Outdoor Leadership School, Knowles, in, in Wyoming, about their groups that go out and they go through and they make a scale of zero is unsafe to 10 is safe and nothing they come up with gets over about a two or a three. So that's the kind of situation you're into. So, yeah. Here's a, a question. What color is lightning and, and why is it that color? Um, where's my big nice picture here? Lightning starts out white. And uh, yeah, this picture is very good. It's all it in its original form. When you're looking at the where the fulgurite hits, it's bright white. With distance, things in the air will um, make color occur, as you can see in this picture here. With some distance, just turning to a reddish orange. Most likely, just things in the air pollution as well as natural processes. The colors are all due to what happens between you as an observer and where the lightning was. It's all due to what's in the air because if it's absolutely clear, it will still be. It'll be white. I suppose it may get a little bit bluish just from the uh, molecules in the air. Here's one here from Carol. Wants to know: Does a positive lightning strike look different from a negative lightning strike? Uh, not really. But there's one. Whoops, went the wrong way. There's one thing that does happen: is that positives only have one return stroke. That, be, that is one way you probably can tell. Now, there are negative cloudy grounds that only have one return stroke, but they're relatively scarce, probably 10 or 20 percent of the time, if you remember the number. The negatives usually have multiple return, return strokes, and so when you see them shimmering, those are return strokes. You can be sure that that was a negative. If you just see one come down, then that, uh, that may well have been a positive. Uh, all one. cloud flashes is our 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 single stroke. So, yeah. Okay. Dean would like to know: Are PVC water pipes as dangerous as metal water pipes? I think so. I think it's the water that's conducting the electricity, not the pipes themselves. Okay. Let me get a couple more on here. Elsie uh, wants to know that our new lightweight cars are made out of plastic. Are they not safe? Um, that's a good question. The um, all these are good questions. I, these are excellent. I'm really glad you're paying attention. <laughs> um, they actually, I think, have enough metal in them that they're still safe. The thing, the vehicles, I, I say, fully enclosed metal top vehicles. The ones that are unsafe are are all fiberglass or they have um, a cloth top like a convertible. Uh, those are distinctly unsafe. And also small, uh, golf carts, they're not fully enclosed and they don't provide protection for that reason. I don't think there's a problem. Now that leads to the question of aircraft. Um, there's a lot of uh, effort going into composite aircraft these days, composite materials. I've been to some conferences in the last 10 years where the lightning protection people were in great agony over the problem that they were told to make it lightning safe, but don't add any weight to the plane. And they said, we can't do it. We have to have metal. And so what happens in these um, composite material aircraft are that there are metal strips embedded throughout the plane so that when lightning hits the plane, or actually the plane induces the lightning, it happens all the time, um, it has a path to follow and then it arts out safely into the air. Um, without those metal strips in there, they would be entirely unsafe for fuel and for electronic systems. But So they've had to have a balance between adding some weight to make them safe from lightning and, and actually try to keep the weight down absolutely as minimal as possible. So they were in a big quandary about five to ten years ago when this was going on. But I don't know how that applies to uh, vehicles. I think there's enough metal in there for the roll bars and so on that it's still safe. Ron, here's one from a, a person who wants to know if they're camping in the middle of the night and a thunderstorm comes up. 
uh, where should they seek shelter? I, I remember hearing too that campers are more vulnerable because they're laying flat on the ground as well. So you have more body touching the, the ground. What, what's the story yeah. on those things? Well, go to your vehicle. That's it. Or if you're in a campground with... Um, like a bathhouse or something? Yeah, bathhouses or um, maybe a registration area. Not an open-sided one, but one that's completely enclosed. Uh, that's the way to go. Boy, is that inconvenient. Two o'clock in the morning, the thunderstorm rolls in, and you have to get up. Yeah, well, I have, unfortunately, there are so many cases of camping, of people being killed. and it, It's lying flat on the ground, even standing. Um, under a tree because it's nice, and so on and so on. So that is an unavoidable conflict. Can you comment on sprites, Ed would like to know, at the top of uh, thunderstorm clouds? Yeah, I haven't studied these directly, but I've seen a lot of presentations up to just a couple of weeks ago. Um, they're out there. They're very weak, uh, visibly, visually. Um, I have not seen one. I've kind of looked for them. The, they tend to occur above really large thunderstorm complexes, and uh, those tend to be on the plains, uh, eastern Colorado, and uh, places like that. Actually, they've been observed now in South America, and China, and um, Spain, I think, in the last few years. But they're always, almost always above large, larger thunderstorms, like mesoscale convective complexes that are tens or hundreds of miles across, and they're very faint. Um, you have to be in a low light situation, and ideally in a situation where you can look horizontally out for like 30 to 50 miles so that the storm isn't over you and you're looking sort of out at the top of the storm and you might see them coming up. I, I have tried here in Arizona, we have storms to the south of us toward Mexico, and I haven't seen one yet. Here, here's an interesting question. Um, Milton in, in Minnesota wants to know, are some trees more conductive to lightning than others? Which trees are hit the most? I remember seeing a, something about this recently in, in, oh, a, in a magazine. I, this is one of those European things that I sort of don't like. Um, you can see damage just better on some types of trees than on other trees. And so I don't think these uh, samples are very real. Um, if there are this tree that I showed John A. Autry's uh, picture of here. Um, where'd it go? There it is. This tree here, I don't know what it is, but he went back. I talked to him, I don't know, between five and eight years afterwards, and he said he went back the next day or the next week, and he saw no sign of damage to it. He went back five seven or eight years later, and they still saw no damage to it. We know for sure that that tree was actually hit, and so some trees are more vulnerable to it than other ones are. It may depend on how much moisture is in the, uh, in the trunk. It may depend on whether it's wet and what kind of uh, uh, stage of growth the outer bark is in and so on. So I'm, Europeans were very big in this, I have to say back 20, 50 years ago, and they used to go out and count them. But I think they were only counting the ones that were vulnerable to lightning, and so I'm not sure it meant very much. It's, it's an interest of mine that you see these sorts of things in lightning where it's kind of missed the point, I think. You know, you know Ron, I remember seeing a presentation. I was out in uh, Nebraska, and they talked about that people getting hit with lightning, that those who were wet with the rain uh, they, they used this baseball bat and showed some wood that if the wood was wet, the lightning went around it and didn't affect the interior, where if it was dry, so somebody in Colorado where it doesn't rain, if there's no verga, if there's verga coming down or something, they were more likely to not survive the lightning strike than if you had rain and water on the outside of you. What's yeah. the story on that? Have you well, that's, that prob or? that's probably all true. Um, but. You know, we're talking about are you going to be injured with lifelong debilitating injuries or are you going to get killed? It's sort of a sure. Uh, it's kind of the curiosity thing. I think I'd rather just say if you were at a baseball game and you had a parking lot nearby, go to your car and you would have been fine. So, uh, yeah, those are sort of secondary things. We're going to wind it up here. I've got to, we'll take uh, about two more questions and and then uh, we're almost at 20 past the hour. Uh, somebody asked if there, someone is outside 
and uh, outside of a structure, lightning hits the lightning rod on the structure, would they be at risk for ground effect charge from the in-ground post of the lightning rod? Yeah, probably. I, um, the pole goes down into the ground, but uh, certainly there'll be a little bit of coming out sideways. That's why I was saying that when lightning hits a house, you probably don't want to, you don't want to be in contact with wiring plumbing because there'll be some uh, effect certainly going through the building. Um, you, you just can't get 100.0% of everything coming down that wire. So yeah, should have been inside the building and then it was, there's not an issue. That's the whole point. Um, if you're right next to the building, just be inside the building. question is, theoretically, is that going on? And I suspect yes. Um, but now that I think of it, I've seen ground rods from uh, lightning rod systems from houses that have been struck and I haven't seen any dirt or grass damage around it so it, it's pretty effective actually. Okay, you know, I'm going to, there's some real quick questions here, we'll go through these real quick. Um, someone wants to know, uh, Patricia in Illinois, what about a car with a moonroof? Is that safe? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, I would say probably safe. Um, you're probably going to have it closed, but of course it's still glass. I would think there's enough continuous metal, if it's like a foot or two across, that a strike to the car will have enough surface area to spread out. But that little space there is probably not a big problem. It'll probably be closed anyway in the rain. Here's one from Andy. What temperature does a lightning bolt run? You may have already mentioned this, but he'd like to you know, mention that again. The numbers are between 30 and 50,000 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Doesn't matter much, but yeah, it's it's hot uh, stuff. Hot stuff, yes. Right. Yeah. And here's our last question for the day. Uh, can These you are all really, really good questions. I just want to say I thank all of you for really uh, bringing up some great stuff. I don't have answers for all of them, but I love them. And there's some yes. we weren't able to get to, so Ronald will try to answer those over the next couple of weeks for you. It will, he'll have your email addresses. Uh, the last one of the day, can you use your AM radio band for lightning detection? Well, what you're doing with AM, turn, I used to do that growing up, turn it down toward 550, 600, 650, or something like that. You are picking up radiated energy from the lightning. Um, but you can't tell how far away it is because the um, range of intensity in terms of kiloamps of, a, of lightning strikes have been measured from as low as 5,000 amps up to 500,000 amps. So it's a two order of magnitude difference. So you can't necessarily tell whether uh, a sharp, strong one is close by or a weak one close by or a strong one quite a ways away. In general, it tells you, that, yes, there is some lightning activity somewhere, but it doesn't tell you the direction and it doesn't really tell you the distance particularly well. It's, an, it's a good first check to see whether something's happening. Well, Ron, thank you for taking your time out today to be with us. We, we, this is really a fascinating presentation, uh, really interesting stuff. Great questions from yes. our volunteers out there. Uh, we're going to go ahead and post some of the links, the lightning safety uh, link on online uh, on our webinar page. We will have this webinar, uh, it, we're recording it right now, we'll have that up probably tomorrow for those who are, who are not able to listen today, if you have friends that would like to, to listen to it. And uh, so thank you again. Uh, we want you folks out there to take a moment as you sign off to take a look at our survey, if you can complete that. And we'd like you to join us again coming up. This, our next webinar is going to be in the evening. So that'll be on the 14th of June on a Thursday evening. And Chris Lancy from the National Hurricane Center will be on to talk about hurricanes. So uh, that should be a really exciting webinar. We'll, we'll put some stuff on the web, but hope you'll sign up for that. Again, Ron, thanks so much. And uh, until next time, we'll uh, so long from, from Coco Ross headquarters. Thank you.